This message comes from NPR sponsor Rosetta Stone, an expert in language learning for 30 years. Right now, NPR listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership to 25 different languages for 50% off. Learn more at rosettastone.com slash NPR. What have you learned to appreciate about your hometown over time? There's something about being unhoused in a place that you love, Mm -hmm. where I remember just walking the streets at night and feeling like the city belonged to me and only me because you're at your most invisible then. I'm Rachel Martin, and this is Wild Card, the show where cards control the conversation. Each week, my guest chooses questions at random from a deck of cards. Pick a card, one through three. Questions about the memories, insights, and beliefs that have shaped them. On the horizon, there is an excitement that I have not yet touched, and I just know that I, the fastest way to get there is to run to it. My guest this week is writer Hanif Abdurraqib. In the process of running to it, I will stumble over some excitements that I perhaps also did not know existed to me. I think a lot about appreciation. I teach my kids that treating gratefulness like a daily practice can help them build meaningful lives. I've actually got sort of an evolution of appreciation in my mind. The first step is observation, right? Pay attention to the thing. The next step, appreciate the thing. Then find meaning in it. But the highest form of appreciation is reverence. Reverence is bigger and deeper than appreciation. It's divine. Reverence reminds us of our small place in the universe. Holding something or someone with reverence is an act of optimism, I think. It's a way to acknowledge that there are miracles in this world that make living not just tolerable, but beautiful. Writer Hanif Abdurraqib is really good at reverence. Maybe it's because he's written about some of the hardest parts of living. He's been incarcerated. He's lived on the streets. He has lost people, including his mom when he was just 13 years old. When I talked to him last year, he told me something I'll never forget, that he tries to be a good steward to his grief. Because it lives inside him and it's not going away. And maybe understanding grief helps him understand reverence. And that's what differentiates him and his work, to me anyway. How we can write about an Aretha Franklin song and make it a prayer. Or a sports arena and make it a church. And, as he does in his most recent book, There's Always This Year... He can write about watching the rise of LeBron James in Ohio and make it feel like witnessing a miracle. His writing always makes me feel hopeful and alive, and it is my pleasure to welcome Hanif Abdurraqib to Wildcard. Hey. Hi, thank you for having me. It's good to talk to you again. Oh, I'm so happy to talk to you again. So are you up for this? I'm, I'm very I'm very excited. I love a game. I don't get a chance to play games as much as I'd like to these days. I so I'm, like I'm very that's, interested. I, that makes me sad for you, Hanif. I feel I know, like I'm you, on the road too much. I can't. Uh, and when I do play games, it's just like video games in my house, which is thrilling, but (laughs) I I do miss a game night. I miss like a, you know, a raucous game night with friends. I will hold up three cards at a time and you will pick one at random. Okay. And then you answer the question on that card. Oh, Mm. but I won't see the questions, right? That's right. You will not. Mm -mm. Okay. No, it's random. You've got two tools at your disposal. You get one skip. Okay. Okay. You get one flip. So you can ask me to answer the question before you do. This is great. This is great. If initially I thought this would be horrible for my anxiety, but having those two <laughs> options, having those two help? options, is, yeah, that yeah. helps in a massive way. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. There's, there are escape hatches. Um, <laughs> we're breaking it up into three rounds, a few questions in each round, and we'll get deeper as we go. Oof. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. You're going to be great. All right, round one. Three cards in my hand. Pick one, two, or three. Two. Two. Where would you go to feel safe as a kid? Um, you know, I'm the youngest of four, and I lived in a very loving household, but a household where everyone had their things. And being the youngest of four, you know, I spent a lot of time um, alone. But the good news is this was during the era, this is in the 90s. It was a really robust era of college radio and radio in general. Hmm. And so 
where I went to feel safe was kind of inside of the world afforded to me by headphones. Uh I would put headphones on and I would record songs off of the radio onto cassette tapes. I would be making mixtapes in real time off of the radio, which required a lot of precision. It required a lot of attentiveness. And, you know, you didn't hit stop on the tape when you're recording because that would be like a hard stop. You had to have the pause pause button. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I remember. And so, you know, it required precision and thoughtfulness and attention. And it was a way that I felt extremely in control. Hmm. I was saying, I can't control what is coming next on the radio, but I can control what comes next on this tape. And to wait by a radio all day uh, and hear the DJ announce a song that is your song, that feels miraculous. I miss that feeling. I wish I could bottle that feeling, feeling like something is being delivered just for you. Mm -hmm. Um, In a world where, as the youngest, I felt like so few things were just specifically for me. I got a lot of hand-me-downs. I got a lot of secondhand things. I got a lot of things that had been loved by others. Mm -hmm. And... um, you know, to say, I've been waiting on this song all day, and here it is. It's mine. Hmm. That's the thing that's hard to communicate to the to the youngs. Um, <laughs> the the ephemeral magic of that oh, happening, of course. right? Yeah. And and like being there to capture it, and it it made it all the more special. It's like getting a gift. Just that, even though the sound quality wasn't great, even though you know sometimes the DJ talks over the end or over the beginning. It's still yours. And for me, when I was a kid, I I so often felt like I was not in control of anything. Mm-hmm. Not even in a harsh way or a violent way. I just think being the youngest, I you know, I had to wait on people to drive me places, or I had to wait on people to finish with clothes so I could wear the clothes, or I had to wait on all of these things and to say, I have enough money to buy a blank 90-minute cassette tape and I have a time on an afternoon that is just my time where I can sit with headphones on by the radio and wait for a DJ to tell me, hey, I've got something just for you. Mm. That's special. Mm. Oh, I love that memory. Thank you. Okay, we got three more cards. Okay. Three more Uh, cards. Pick one, two, or three. 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 Oh, that was like a gimme for you. (laughs) What have you learned to appreciate about your hometown over time? Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, where do I begin? Yeah. You know, um, (laughs) one story I like telling, not because I like reminding people that I've got a MacArthur, but because it's funny, uh, (laughs) is that the day that the The MacArthur— MacArthur Genius Awards, by the way, for those who don't know. Yeah, the MacArthur Grant. The day it was announced, um, I had dinner plans with a friend, and these plans were, you know, like— set in stone for a while and in the day that that gets announced is a hectic day. it's like obvious it's a, a wild day like you have to do a million different things and so i was uh i was running behind and this dinner was you know this friend had a plan after i had a plan after we were going to a concert all this stuff and so i was running behind and I, I texted her and i was like you know i'm running late but i'll pull up and i pulled up like you know 15 minutes late to dinner and she put her hand on my shoulder and said i'm very proud of you you may be a genius but you really messed up my dinner plans <laughs> <laughs> and i love that story not because because it's so reflective of this thing in columbus where people are proud of me and we are proud to live amongst each other but no one's impressed you know like mm. i think it's really wonderful for me to to live in a place where people are maybe happy that I'm there as I am happy they're there and there is work that they connect to and feel proud to have representing their place um, and proud of me perhaps for creating it. But there's no um, overwhelming feeling of we are so impressed that we are placing you on a pedestal above us. Mm -hmm. And I would, I don't want, you know, I, I have lived in this place my whole life. There are people here who knew me when I was a kid. There are people here who knew me when I was getting arrested. There are people here who knew me when I was sleeping on the streets And it is a place that really dismantles that good-bad binary. So often, in so much of the narrative of people who read the book and read about my time unhoused or jailed or these things, this idea of you were bad and now you're good, that's so flawed and kind of ridiculous because um, when I'm in my hometown, when I'm in Columbus, I'm reminded that, um, you know, I don't know if I was bad then. I don't know if I'm good now. Mm -hmm. I think that in both instances— in all instances in my through my living, I am doing my best to survive with the resources afforded to me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a thing about Columbus that I love because people don't look at my life and career with a shrug. There's certainly a lot of affection, but the 
greater question that is always asked of me and the question I have to rise to is, what kind of community member do you want to be? Yeah. Um, what kind of neighbor do you want to be? What kind of person in the world do you want to be? Which is a better and more useful question to me than what kind of artist do you want to be? And if I answer all those other questions, well, the question of what kind of artist I want to be answers itself. Um, Was there any part of I mean, I'm talking to you when you're in New York right now. Um, you know, New York is where the writers go. And L.A. is where the writers <laughs> yeah. go. I mean, people can go anywhere now, but there are other places you could have lived and thrived and written. Um what, what was important to you about staying there? I don't really know how well I know myself anywhere else. And I would, at this point, I don't want to find out. Mm -hmm. There's something about being unhoused in a place that you love mm -hmm. where I remember just walking the streets at night and feeling like the city belonged to me and only me because you're at your most invisible then. I think to be unhoused in a place is to be either invisible or a nuisance, right? Either you're in, invisible or someone is is hassling you or you are presented as some kind of um, troublesome figure to a, to a geography or a population. But being invisible made you feel ownership over the city in a I different I think way? so. Huh. At night, you know, like I remember walking the street and, and being aware that I had nowhere to sleep, but also being aware that that meant I had everywhere to sleep, you know, huh. um, that gives you some kind of false sense of ownership, but you also see a city for what it is. Mm. Um, you see through the kind of lies that a city might dress itself up in in order to make itself marketable mm -hmm. so columbus for example is now trying to market itself as like a tech city or food city all of these things that that don't actually serve the population that is living and breathing and actively there mm -hmm. but to be among that population and to be among a, pop a version of that population in my case where i was extremely at a margin meant that i got to see the city's most honest face behind all of its false masks yeah. and to me, that I got to see that and say, you know what, I actually think I still love it. Hmm. I still love the city as its most honest self because I know what that most honest self is and I can cut to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to learn that about any other place. Yeah. And I don't have the time or energy, I think, um, to learn how to love a place at its most honest, which I require. I require oh, yeah. that. I mean, and that's I, the purest I, love, right? It's, it's purest like love, yeah. seeing a, a person, a place... For everything that it is, and still choosing to love it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was beautiful. We got three more in this three round. Three more. One, I, two, three. I feel like I've done two and three, but I'm not going to go one right away. I'm going to go back to two. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in going back to two. <laughs> okay. What do you admire about your teenage self? Oh, uh, what a great question. <sighs> I think if I trace it back, my relationship and my comfort with loneliness or being alone or isolation or whatever you want to call it was really fostered as a teenager. Hmm. I had, I'm the, again, the youngest of four, and I have a brother who's very close to me in age. Um, and he was so much, I mean, like startlingly cooler than me. Still is, I think. Um, still is much cooler than me. Um, but back then, I mean, he was way better looking, like just immensely better looking. Um, <laughs> you said it twice. So yeah, it really must extremely be better looking, uh, <laughs> literal football star, like high school football star, um, had a cool car, like just was cool. And I wasn't that. And we went to separate high schools and even going And the reason we went to separate high schools is because I was like, I were one grade apart. I was like, I cannot live. Right. And, but it didn't matter. In like the legend of him, like bled into my high school, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I, I could not escape being, you know, so often I think people begin to, we all, I, not we all, but many people pathologize their, um, place in a birth order. Yeah. Um, and I think so many people that I know ascribe being the youngest to all these burdensome things, but I've lately been thinking about how grateful I was to be the youngest sibling that mm -hmm. I got to witness people that I just ostensibly and inherently admired mm -hmm. and just kind of copy bits of them. Mm -hmm. But my teenage years, I really embraced not fitting in and not in a mm -hmm. way that was really rebellious. This was also kind of at the dawn of the, the internet as, as the internet, as it became me, capital I internet, like message board era, yeah. blog era. And I would, <laughs> I would be on these message boards. these like music message boards. 
um, where I would like lie about my age so that people would take me seriously, you know, because I knew so much about songs and records. So I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm like a 40 year old record collector, you know, <laughs> um, and that was just how I was, which is, you know, I, I would not recommend that to people now, perhaps. Uh, but, yeah, right. but that is, that's how I found community because I'd be on there talking about like Kate Bush production techniques, you know what I mean? As a 15, 16 year old, but these older, these older people, largely men, you know, they thought I was like one of them. They thought I was their peer because yeah. if I was like, you know, I'm just a teenager in high school and, and I don't have a lot of friends. And like, the reason I know all this is because I don't have a ton of, I'm, yeah. while all, while all the guys my age are out having fun, I'm just in my dad's house listening to records, you know? But that was okay. Like, that you, was great you, so for me. you, you were, yeah. you were able to appreciate what your brother had going on yeah. and be like, I'm not going to be him. I'm going to be this other thing. It comes, you know, Everyone now, I don't read about myself often, which is, I would recommend that for everyone who gets written about to any degree. But I do know that one thing that gets talked about is, is a quote unquote encyclopedic knowledge of music and songs. And, and that's true. Sure. It, it comes at a cost though, I think. Um, not a cost that I'm ashamed of or not a cost that I feel, but yeah, I mean, so many formative years of social activity and socialization for me were spent inside listening to records mm -hmm. because, um, I got so comfortable with my own self, mm -hmm. which is a blessing, you know, like I, I'm so grateful for my teenage self for yes, enduring the ache of loneliness from time to time, but saying, gosh, I mean, it's much like me when I was a little kid and escaping into the world of making mixtapes, right? Mm -hmm. I was saying there was a world where in this record that I love was made and I want to know everything about that world. Yeah. And I can sink into that world. And it's not this one for a little while. It's not this one. And I get to be an audience to that world. That created within me, I think, a real curiosity. Nothing makes me happier than kind of continually knocking on the door of someone's history and saying, what else can you show me? Tell me the coolest thing. Tell me the funniest thing. Tell me about your mother's favorite thing. I get it. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> this is like your whole thing, right? This is your whole thing. And I wouldn't have had that if I were, I think, this isn't to say that my brother is not cool and curious. Again, he's still much cooler than me. But I, the, the depth with which I pursue, pursue, I think, curiosity is because when I was a teenager, I had to say, well, I'm not going to be that. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to be the, yeah, I played sports. I mean, I did the things, but I, I knew I wouldn't be that. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends. I didn't have, you know, um, but I learned to be some kind of, deeply intuitive and I learned how to escape in a way that wasn't detrimental but that honed a real kind of just hunger for wanting to know everything I can about everyone I love. When we come back, Hanif explains how running makes him optimistic about getting older. There has to be a, well, what's next? In that curiosity of, well, what's next is enough to push me another mile and maybe another mile. This message comes from Apple Card. If you love iPhone, you'll love Apple Card. It's the credit card designed for iPhone. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.40% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account through Apple Card. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app. Subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms and more at AppleCard.com. This message comes from ShipStation, your e-commerce command center. Take control of your growing order volume with ShipStation's all-in-one shipping software that centralizes your fulfillment, automates repetitive tasks, and delivers the best carrier rates all in one place. Integrate effortlessly with over 180 e-commerce platforms and marketplaces. Save time and scale efficiently with features like inventory synchronization. For a free 60-day trial, go to ShipStation.com NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Progressive Insurance, where drivers who switch could save hundreds on car insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. This message comes from Scholastic with the novel The Witching Wind from best-selling author Natalie Lloyd. The Witching Wind is a heart-expanding adventure about the magic of family, friendship, and the lengths people go for the ones they love. The Witching Wind is available wherever books are sold. Before we get to round two, 
Um, this is the part of the show where I ask you what you're working on. And what you're working on, as far as I know, is a very cool thing that is yeah. happening at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, right? Yes. Tell me. I have like a week-long poetry festival called, I guess, It Was My Destiny to Live So Long, which is a line from a poem by June Jordan. Mm -hmm. It is happening November 4th through the 9th. Um, every night will be a different night of programming except election night. That Tuesday we're taking off, but then all the other nights are going to be a, a, a night of programming. And that is going to involve film, concerts, uh, poetry readings. Um, we're going to have um, Jamila Woods, McKinley Dixon, and the musician Tasha. All three of the musicians are going to play um, some music that nods to writers that they admire. And um, this is the first of three years. BAM's made a three-year commitment to let me do this, which they is— They gave you a fancy title. Don't you have, like, a yeah, curator-in-chief or yeah, something? It's, like, it's, it's a title that is uh, on a— a little like banner that I never look at. So, but it is a fancy title. <laughs> Love to have a fancy title. That's um, right. MacArthur and, genius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, you know, if you're like, I don't really know about poems, there's something for you. There'll be something yeah. for you this week. Election week. Everyone will need a little escape. Then. Everyone will need something. We're moving to round two. Uh, three new cards, deeper as we go. One, two, or three. I'm going to go one. You're going to go one this time. Yeah, finally one. What have you learned to take less seriously? Um, you know, I've learned to take aging less seriously, Ooh. I think. I'm a runner, so I'm running a total of like around 45 to 50 miles a week over That's the course of, of six days. It's a lot of mileage. Mm -hmm. And I am, you know, like I'm, I am now 41, you know, and I know that 41 is not knocking on the door of death or what have you. But it, you know, for me, um, there's this mantra that I have because running for me, um, the first 10 minutes or no, no matter how much I do it, the first 10 to 12 minutes are not fun. Yeah. Not fun at all. My body is doing something that my brain and my body and brain aren't aligned. And so there's this thing that I tell myself, even if, if after those 12 minutes, it's still challenging. It's uh, too long to stop too far to go back, which means, you know, I've been doing this too long to stop and I'm too far away from my house to go back. That's, right. that's a, of course, that's a false thing. I mean, nope. I can always stop. I can always turn around, mm -hmm. but to tell myself that suggests that, there has to be a, well, what's next? In that curiosity of, well, what's next is enough to push me another mile and maybe another huh. mile. And that is really what running, that's, you know, and I think, honestly, um, there's an excitement I feel around aging that is like, how can I get to the point where I, I've learned enough and understood enough and um, I just want to sprint towards whatever keeps me excited about the next moment yeah and yeah. i feel like the possibilities for that don't decrease as i get older i thought they would i was huh. always like there's only so many things i can be excited about and surely they're not infinite and i will run up against a wall and then i will live the rest of my days with a kind of a buffet of familiar excitements yeah but gosh you know like i because i don't take aging seriously and because i get to say i'm still here so i'm not finished i'm still here so i'm not finished i'm still here so i'm not finished yeah. that means that i am on the horizon there is an excitement that i have not yet touched and i just know that I, the fastest way to get there is to run to it and in the process of running to it i will stumble over some excitements that i perhaps also did not know existed to me but i guess uh, I, to, to define seriously i mean it sounds like you are taking it seriously because you're yeah. just you're like you're not getting paralyzed by it no i'm rigorous i think i'm rigorous about my seeking you know i'm like yeah, seeking and i'm rigorous intention. about it's real intention yeah it's real like intentional looking yeah. i don't want to stumble over anything and discard it without knowing that it'll potentially bring me pleasure mm. while working on my book i thought of this all the time a real tragedy to me a real emotional crisis that i momentarily found myself in is realizing that it is impossible, it will be impossible for me and for all of us to 
meet or know every single person in the world capable of loving us well. It's just impossible. There's too many people in the world. So many of them don't care that we exist or know that we exist or have a, you know, and vice versa, those people also. And that's just impossible. We're never going to live a life. There is someone perhaps in a country I don't I don't know and will never go to who mm-hmm. could be capable of loving me in a way that would unlock something for me. And that in some ways is tragic, but it also means for me that I get to, with whatever time I have left, turn towards the people who are directly in front of me, who have already showed a, a capacity and eagerness to love me well, and say, here's what I've learned about myself as I age, and here's how that might help you love me better. And I'm curious uh, about what you've learned as you've accrued tenure on this earth, and tell me how to love you well today, which might not be the way I can love you well tomorrow, or in a year, or when we're 50 or 60, but like, let's just build a foundation now, because we're here, And through our time, just through like pure tenure, we are acquiring a new language, I think, for our needs, for our desires, for what it takes to love us in a way that um, carries us. Mm. And those ways accumulate. And those ways make aging uh, something to get excited, for me to get excited about, to know that the version of myself that I am today is a fraction of the version I can become in even a year or might become in two years. And that there are ways that the people who are touchable and directly in front of me will aid me in that, mm-hmm. will effectively push me and say, it's time to sprint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's what I need. And so I, I suppose that is taking it seriously in a way, but I don't take it seriously in a way where I'm haunted by it. Oh my God. And you brought it back around to running? Yeah. What are you? Like a professional or something? <laughs> okay. Three new cards. Three, three new cards. Three different cards. New, different, one, two, or three. Let's do three. Three. Well, now this is interesting because this feels a little bit like what you just said, but but you picked it. So <laughs> what's an expression of love you're trying to get better at? Oh, can, I would love to answer this, but can I have you answer it? Oh, yes, you can. Why, yes, you can, honey. Okay, so you're you're flipping this. Yeah. What's an expression of love? Oh. So I'm I I I guess I'm gonna brag a little bit on myself. I I'm I think I'm pretty good at telling people. Sure. Um I I'm I'm actually good with words, right? Like that's my thing. So I have no problem articulating to people what they mean to me. I do it a lot. I make people uncomfortable probably <laughs> because I, I'll just say it a lot. Um, um, I think I am, um, I am more selfish with my time. Yeah. So I think when I th- an expression of love I'm trying to get better at is it, sometimes it's really easy to tell a person what they mean to you. That's easy mm-hmm. for me. That's not hard. Yeah. Um, sometimes it can be hard to get on a plane when you know someone isn't necessarily in crisis, but they could use you sitting on a couch with them. Um, or someone down the street, you know, I've got a busy day, but I know that there's some, one of my neighbors – who could maybe use a little cheering up and I make all kinds of excuses about why my life is real busy Yeah, and I can just text them or I can just call them and, you know, words are easy. So I think showing up. Showing up is, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, in the winter, both myself and one of my neighbors, we really just, depending on how our moods, I mean, we struggle with depression. We live with depression, both of us. Mm. And if it snows, this has been the case. I moved in this house in 2020. And this has been the case at least once a year. If it snows real heavy and one of us notices that the other hasn't shoveled the sidewalk, we just do it. And and we don't talk. Like we really, like we nod to each other when we see each other, but we don't like, we don't talk about it. We don't make a thing about it. It's not like a one-to-one exchange. We mm-hmm. just do it because the sidewalk needs to be shoveled and it's hard to get out of bed, you know? Yeah. So that those things, yeah. I. All right, I guess it's my turn. I will say two quick things. Well, they hopefully they're quick. One is... <laughs> Like when I've tried to be more specific uh, when telling people that something reminded me of them. Mm. Um, But the other thing that's more important is apologizing 
I, I really want to be good at apologizing. Yeah. And I think too, I mean, like, I'm going to be real. Like, I mean, coming up, um, I, I did have a good relationship with kind of unlearning some of the traps of masculinity as they're traditionally presented, but still, you know, being taught or, or and I think this is called, I mean, we're, gosh, we're a culture of just robust cruelty and cruelty is really our, I believe societally our first language, you know? Hmm. Um, and so to apologize feels like you are both failing and ceding ground. Uh-huh. But like, I want to cede ground to the people I love. Yeah. I want to say, how can I do better by you the next time? Mm-hmm. Um, and I also want to set a blueprint for how I honor just this idea that I require grace. I want to offer grace to people because I know I require it myself. Mm-hmm. But if I hold on, if I hold tightly to an apology, that is not a graceful practice for anyone. Mm-hmm. And so one, I'm trying to really work on, you know, I think I'm okay at it. I, I'm continually trying to work on the language of apology, immediate apology too. The moment I realize I've done wrong, I don't want a large distance between that moment and the moment where I articulate that I've done wrong and that I'm so eager to do better because I think on the other side of that doing better, um, there's a whole new language in, in, in architecture for how we can love each other better and, and more uh, robustly. In a moment, the final round. If I have lived a life where what is most remembered about me is that I wrote some books and won some awards, that's a really failed life. This message comes from the University of Kansas Health System. Understanding a patient's concerns starts with one thing, listening. Their doctors work to build trust and understanding with every patient to help them feel more confident with their health care journey. No matter your condition or treatment needs, the University of Kansas Health System remembers you are a person first and always because a better relationship means better care. Learn how clinical excellence delivered with compassion can help you at kansashealthsystem.com. This message comes from NPR sponsor Progressive. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit their website to get a quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. Then, just choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Bluehost. Try Bluehost Cloud, the hosting plan made for WordPress creators by WordPress experts. With 100% uptime, fast load times, and 24-7 support, your sites can handle high traffic spikes. Visit Bluehost.com. Last round. The cards are red. Oh, gosh. I don't know. I, red is not supposed color. to be sc- yeah. right. Why? I think it's an inviting red. I think it's. <laughs> I think it's some orange. I think it's a. It's a warm, inviting. Yeah. Um, it's not red. I'm gonna stop calling it that. Okay, three new cards. One, two, or three. Two. Are you comfortable with being forgotten? <laughs> Yeah, well, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, I'm I'm in community in Columbus. I'm in community with elders, like really older folks, significantly Mm -hmm. older folks than me. Um, You know, when I was in and out of jail, I got arrested one last time. Uh, and my record was such that it was, you know, the judge was like, man, we've like used up all your probation. You've been in and out of jail for several, you know, and he was like, either I'll give you two options. Last chance, either you go volunteer at this senior center or you do six months in jail. And me in my twenties back then, I was like, just give me the six months, man. Like I, you know, I'm not going to serve them all anyway. <laughs> and thankfully I had a lawyer who was like, no, 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 he'll take the, <laughs> he'll take the senior. And I was like, volunteer at the senior center for a year. That's fine. And I did it for a year, and I just haven't left since. <laughs> and so huh. I'm, I'm in uh, this really rich community of elders. Of course, they've all, you know, some of them have moved on, some yeah. of them have passed. It's been years. But I don't think – I say this to say some of them have no one. Like some of them really have outlived 
they have no kids, they've outlived all the people they love, and they are the last to go, right? And there's a real loneliness in that one. But I've begun to ask myself the question of, what purpose do I get to serve in the life of someone who, in their own language, of yeah. course, has no one, quote unquote, no one. Yeah. And I think the answer is I get to be the person who doesn't forget them when they go. If that's it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I sit with them, play cards with them, we chop it up, we talk. But the major function is, is I think, someone saying, I have no one else. I would love to not be forgotten. I would love to be remembered in some way. I am comfortable myself. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with being forgotten. I'm not interested. I mean, it won't be in my, I'll, I'll be dead, so it won't be in my business. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would love to be remembered by the people who love me, by the people who are in community with me, but even that's not promised. And yeah. I think you have to earn that. You have to earn a life that allows you to not be forgotten. Yeah. If I have lived a life where what is most remembered about me is that I wrote some books and won some awards, that's a really failed life mm. uh, for me. I would love to live a life that is so far beyond what I produce that maybe people, particularly in Columbus, where I live and love, say, well, the books were fine, but, you know, the books were good, but he was also like a, a really good tried. bridge. Yeah, he's really good at bridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last question. All right. Last set of cards. One, two, or three. Let's do two. I started with two. Let's do two again. What's your best defense against despair? Um, you know, I live with depression and anxiety and... um occasionally I'll have a real moment of crisis, like a real moment, week long, can't get out of the bed kind of thing. And I remember this happened a few years back where I, you know, and I have, I just have such a great emergency support system in this case, in Columbus especially. And um, there's a friend who has a key to my house who like she knows if it goes like two or three days where she doesn't hear from me, you know, it's time to check in. Mm -hmm. And she, I'll never forget this. She did this thing where she came and just sat by my bedroom door was closed and I was in bed for days. And she came and she just sat by my door. And every now and then she would tap on the door just to let me know she was there. And she would at times, um, like while I slept, like she could tell I was sleeping, she would slide some food in the door. And every few hours she would just tap on the door, which and she wouldn't talk, you know? And it was just her way of communicating I'm here and I'm not going to leave. Like, I'm not going to leave until you leave. Um, you know, you open the door, I'll go home. We don't have to talk. But uh, as long as you're behind the closed door, I will be on the other side of the closed door. And I think that I, you know, that defines the kind of person I would like to be, I think, which operates against, I am sometimes the person in bed, but I also want to have the capacity to be the other person behind the, on the other side of a closed door. And I think that the best way that I operate against despair is feeling like I have a responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. The way that I hope to love and the way I hope to carry myself is to be the kind of friend who says, I am willing, if not eager, to be on the other side of whatever door you're on. And to know that means that, it doesn't mean that I have to become quote unquote better. You know, it doesn't mean I'm, that's not going to be like, my anxiety and depression is cured because I want to be a good friend. That's not what a, that doesn't happen. Um, sorry to deliver the news to anyone. Who, <laughs> that's not going to happen. But what that does do for me is it says, okay, if I am well enough, how can I actually create a functioning ecosystem of care within every circle I'm in mm -hmm. that says we look out for each other. And that to me moves me beyond despair saying that I want to always have the capacity and care that allows me to be the person on the other side of the door tapping lightly. The other thing I will say that pulls me out of despair is so many of my friends now have kids, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't have kids, but I, you know, I don't remember at what point I realized that kids liked me. <laughs> kids really like me, you know, and I don't, I, and I, I think that I've, I've always been like, kids are fine. Like kids are cool. But you know, the past like five years, all my friends having kids and all of them kind of like gravitating towards me. Now I'm like, kids are the greatest. You know, I feel like I'm a, I jokingly call myself like a freelance uncle where I get to, you know, um, and it's, it has changed me. It's like rewired me, like yeah. being witness 
in in I know that this is just how DNA and genetics some, genetics sometimes work, but the fact that like one of my friends who I love more than anything has a child who looks exactly like her makes me predisposed to loving that child more than anything. Even though I already would, the fact that I can look at that child's face and see her face mapped onto it, it makes me say, I would do anything for you right now. You don't even know I exist yet. You know, you're like a, you're like eight months old. You don't even know I'm a real person Mm -hmm. yet, but I would do anything for you. And I want to be here to do anything for you. I want to live in a way that keeps me here for as long as possible so that if you ever need anything, I can be there. Hmm. Despair is inevitable for me. I think that despair hovers and I don't find ways to stop its hovering. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually fine with that because I think that keeps me in tune with the realities of the world that need addressing. Mm -hmm. And it keeps me in tune with what I need to fight back against. And it keeps me in tune with... Um, a real rage that propels me towards love, you know? Yeah. Um, but also, I want to be the kind of uncle type figure who gets called when a date doesn't go well or when someone's parents don't understand them and they want to talk to me or when someone's putting on a prom outfit and they don't like the way they look in it or when someone's, you know, needs a little money to go on a date. I want to live long enough to to be that because um, I feel like all of my friends who I love have carried new people into the world who are waiting for me to love them and they are hopefully waiting to love me. And that means that I get to echo the love I already had for one person into a whole other generation of people. And that is enough to make me say, I just think I want to stick around. If I can help it, I want to stick around. Okay, Hanif, I'd like to do six more rounds with you, but um, (laughs) we made it to the end. Uh, So we always finish this the same way, with a trip in our memory time machine. Oh, great. You get to revisit one moment from your past... This is a moment you would not change anything about. It is just a moment that you would like to linger in a little longer. Which moment do you choose? Um, my mother wrote, my mother wrote on a typewriter. She wasn't like a quote unquote professional writer, as some would say. She worked two jobs. And she would sometimes come home and write, and she would write on weekends on a very loud old typewriter. She would write a novel. (laughs) And I remember one Sunday, I was grounded. I had done who knows what, but I couldn't go outside and play. And it was a nice Sunday. I just want to remind people that your mom died when you were pretty young. Yes, my mom died when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And so this happened when I was maybe 11. Mm -hmm. Um, That was prime grounding age for me because I was always in some nonsense. (laughs) Uh, And I remember I was supposed to stay in my room. That was the ground. That was the punishment. Um, But I remembered that was the time where I was like distinctly, I had become distinctly aware of my mother right as a writer. Hmm. because I, you know, when I was younger, I was like, she's just messing around on that typewriter up there. She's just (laughs) messing around on that machine up there. I didn't even know it was a typewriter. She also sewed at that desk. So it was like, sometimes the sewing machine sounded like a typewriter, you know. She's making noise. Making noise. And I remember being so curious. It was only me and her in the house, I think. And I remember I snuck up the stairs really quietly. They were carpeted stairs. So you could kind of sneak up pretty quiet. If you, you couldn't step. I remember you had to kind of crawl. Uh, because if you stepped, the weight of your full body would make them creak. But if you kind of crawled, you could kind of sneak up. And I remember sneaking up the stairs and peeking in the room and just watching her type. And my mother usually wore head coverings. Most of them wore head covering, mm-hmm. but she didn't have one on her, her, her like whole afro was drinking in the sunlight. And she was kind of humming and just typing. And I just remember sitting and watching And I wasn't supposed to be there. I was supposed to be grounded in my room. And I remember sitting and watching for so long. It felt like hours, but it certainly wasn't hours. And as I got older, I was like, I have to think she knew I was there. Parents are, I mean, parents are like so intuitive. Right. And there's something really thoughtful, I think, about me as an 11-year-old looking over her shoulder in a way while she toiled at this book. And I think that she returns that favor 
you know, like I think she returns that favor for me. Um, I think she's never not present when I am kind of turned away from the world and head down and putting words on the page. And so I feel like not only would I relive that memory, but I think that memory is being relived through through her. Um, I feel like we have created an exchange where we are eternally looking over each other's shoulders as we make something. Hanif Abdul-Rakib, writer, poet, author. He'll have a new series you can catch at the Brooklyn Academy of Music starting on November 4th. Hanif, thank you so much. Thank you. It was so good to talk to you again. It was so good to talk to you. If you like this episode, you should check out my conversation with the poet Nikki Giovanni. Hanif's thoughts about being forgotten reminded me of how Nikki thinks about her legacy, or rather, how she doesn't think about it. Next week on Wildcard, we talk to Sterling Harjo, the creator of the amazing show Reservation Dogs, which is nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Comedy Series. Is there anything in your life that has felt predestined? Yes, all of it. This episode was produced by Lee Hale, with help from Romel Wood and edited by Dave Blanchard. It was fact-checked by Sarah Knight and mastered by Ko Takasugi Chernovin. Wildcard's executive producer is Beth Donovan. Our theme music is by Ramtin Arablui. You can reach out to us at wildcard at npr.org. We love when you do. We'll shuffle the deck and be back with more next week. See you then. This message comes from Schwab. When it comes to managing your wealth, Schwab gives you more choices like full-service wealth management and advice when you need it most. You can also invest on your own and trade on Thinkorswim, Schwab's powerful, award-winning trading platforms. Plus, you'll get low costs, transparent pricing, and 24-7 live help. Schwab understands it's your financial journey, and they believe you should have choices in how you invest. Learn more at schwab.com. This message is brought to you by NPR sponsor, Lisa, in collaboration with West Elm. Discover the new natural hybrid mattress, expertly crafted from natural latex and certified safe foams, designed with your health and the planet in mind. Visit leesa.com to learn more.